Now, how does this primal wound of abandonment, fear and shame, how does it affect our professional and personal success? Well, it affects our ability to, to reach goals because the need for immediate gratification is very strong when we have a lot of unresolved shame and abandonment and abandonment fear. We have a need for immediate gratification. So let's say um, my goal is to advance my career as an author, as a, as a speaker. I want to advance it. But let's say that I have a lot of sadness and fear and, and shame. So the most pleasurable thing that I could do instead of making phone calls and figuring out how to work programs and getting a better website instead of working toward my goal just because i don't feel happy i can do something more pleasurable such as read a book take a nap um, talk to a friend on the phone eat ice cream uh, you know there is immediate gratification so when we have low self-esteem and shame and abandonment fear we tend to succumb to the need for immediate gratification instead of follow a long range goal. And I know both you and I, and probably many of the people listening have achieved a lot. And we know, I'm sure there are a lot of very high achievers out there. We know that for every achievement, we had to delay long term, grat short term gratification. We had to say, not now, I have to study now our friends are out hanging out and having a wonderful time, but we have to stay in and study because we have a test or whatever. So we already, I'm sure in your audience and you and I both have learned how to delay gratification. But even though we're pretty good at it, I'm sure there are areas where we put it off, we, we take the easy answer, we do the easy thing instead. That was my signal to make sure to, to be on, on air. Um, and we do those things, those immediate gratifications, and that instead of promoting ourselves. So everyone, no matter how successful, probably could be more successful if they could work on their abandonment uh, fears, their shame, develop a better relationship with themselves, with the inner self, and work on that need for immediate gratification, which immediately helps to raise your self-esteem. Thank you so much for that insight. Um, how does unresolved abandonment trigger patterns of self-sabotage? Well, you know, the, the self-sabotage, um, again, we're talking about something that really is true for all of us, but to different degrees. The self-sabotage, um, is a way of self-abandoning. So let's take a goal. This is, I'm using a very, um, sort of a, almost a stereotypic goal for women. But let's say the goal is to get in better shape. We're trying to look better. And in order to achieve that goal, we have to go to an exercise program, and we have to eat certain foods and we have to eat more or less than we're already eating or whatever. And it involves all kinds of um, self-sacrifice. If we love ourselves a lot and we have a really good relationship with ourselves, I'm using such a corny example, you know, getting our bodies in shape, but it's perfect. It illustrates if we love ourselves a lot, we're going to do that for ourselves, whatever it takes, go to the exercise program, you know, eat, eat better food, whatever it is, you know, we'll do it. But if there is self-anger, self-hatred, self-criticism, self-rejection, all of this self-abandonment that comes from unresolved abandonment, if we have that, maybe instead of going to the gym, eating better food, we'll eat the ice cream and stay in and not go to the gym because we're abandoning ourselves. So self-sabotage is a direct result of self-abandonment. And what's wonderful about it is that by conceptualizing it that way, it gives us a clue as to how to help ourselves because we can reverse self-abandonment by making a vow to take better care of ourselves. 
and to follow our goals and give ourselves the gift of love, which is to follow our goals. Thank you so much. So the gift of love is to follow our goals. So why do we tend to hide our abandonment, fear and shame and insecurity and vulnerability, even though these are universal emotions? That is, to me, that is the key question because so many people who have, getting in touch with those feelings is difficult for a lot of people, but admitting to weakness is something that is discouraged in our cultures. It's, it's not something people automatically love to do, to be able to say, well, I have terrible abandonment fear and I'm very vulnerable and easily hurt and I'm sensitive and I feel easily insulted and so forth. We have those feelings, but we don't go around announcing them because there's an idea that people have that those feelings are, are their own and not universal. There's a sense that they have a personal weakness to have those feelings. So the difficulty people have is not in, in expressing and admitting to their vulnerabilities and their abandonment fears and their shame. Shame is very hard because we, we really try to keep shame hidden because we feel somehow it makes our faults more obvious, you know. Um, but, but one of the steps that is very positive in taking in an abandonment recovery program is being with a group of people who begin to admit that these things are universal, that we all have them. And then it makes it a little bit easier to say, you know, I too, I have, I have a fear of that also. And as we begin to tune in and recognize the universality, we really join the human race at that point. And then we give up that self-hatred and all that, that feeling of self-condemnation for being weak. We're not weak, we're strong. Because, you know, trauma, there's post-traumatic stress disorder, as we know. You know, you have a trauma, then it weakens you in some ways and causes problems. But there's also post-traumatic growth. So out of trauma comes growth. I, if you and I had a chance to get to know each other in this short time that we have, we might get to discover what happened to you, what happened to me, the traumas that we had. And I'll bet you anything that we would be able to see each other's post-traumatic growth. In what way are you especially strong in a unique way, as unique as your fingerprint? In what way am I strong? What strengths do I have from my traumas that make me not just a little, you know, unusual or quirky. No, strong, capable. What do we each have? It's a fascinating exchange of information. And I can see your strengths easier than I can see my own. So in a group of people, we really get to see the beautiful growth that we have, without even trying to, have created from all of the, you know, the the insecurities and, and the, the traumas that we went through in earlier life. Thank you so much for that. Post-traumatic stress disorder, very popular, but post-traumatic growth. I think I'm hearing that for the first time. I mean, that terminology. I know it happens, but that terminology seems new. So I, didn't, people, uh, yeah. I didn't on. make it up. I saw it written somewhere, mm -hmm. post-traumatic growth. PTG, and I thought, PTG. yes, We once you see it, you know it's true. You can it's suddenly true. think of examples, but it's a wonderful thing to actually look for post-traumatic growth in each other. Thank you so much, that's awesome. And I, I think it's very encouraging for the audience to know that this is something they can look forward to, post-traumatic growth. That in itself, I think the idea of post-traumatic growth is even healing in itself. Just recognize yes, it. It is. It is. That's happened. Yes. Thank you so much. So why do we, um, how can we focus on, you know, you've said that when we get together, we will see, it's easier to see someone else's strength than your own. And obviously community is one of the ways we heal. 
So how can we focus on and share our abandonment wounds in a safe space, which helps to reduce the shame and the fear? Well, it sounds like a, a, a very difficult um, thing to do, but anyone listening can do it. If, if you think of a group as two people, you know, with a friend, once you, you kind of realize how universal things are, you can mention a, a weakness, so-called, a vulnerability, without having to sound weak. You can say, for instance, and I've done this a lot in my work, and I surprise audiences. You know, I, you can say, yes, I have an insecurity about that. Now, people might be surprised to hear you say something sort of self-depreciating but if you say it with a certain dignity and pride they might actually trust you more and feel closer to you even as a speaker to an audience so i i lead with that myself and at first i can see my audience thinking oh she's going to teach us how to feel better and she's got all these problems herself you know of course i do i'm a human being we all do no matter how what work we do we all have vulnerabilities we all have abandonment fear even if it's unconscious you know we all have shame we all have some kind of shame that we're ashamed of we all have these feelings so with dignity and without any apology we can say well you know i have abandonment fears and i have post-traumatic post-trauma from childhood stuff um it gave me strength but yes there are i still i have fears from it we can begin one-on-one -on -one to just start to talk about these things with dignity and pride with the assumption that they're universal and it creates more intimacy with people now you asked about a group and that's a group of just one person to, to a friend but you can when you do this in a group and you create a group and everyone shares you know what they're childhood trauma was or you know they can describe their childhood a little bit and what uh, insecurities came out of that and you get a group of people doing it that group of you know usually it'll be a group of professionals that group who hasn't told you they didn't have to talk about their current personal lives they didn't have to talk about their marriage or you know they didn't have to divulge anything embarrassing going on in their current lives but just by kind of talking in general about you know vulnerabilities that develop and you know childhood issues that group becomes so intimate and close and bonded and there's a level of trust that develops that's 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 great so it doesn't have to be something organized by somebody else each person can find a group even if it's just two of you somebody will yes. share um, your background so that you, you know you're in a safe place, you're talking to somebody who knows where you're coming from. Yeah. The safe great. place is an important piece of that because, you know, it's important. I think uh, most of us have a pretty good instinct for it. I bet most of your listeners. But we kind of know who's safe. We have a sense. Like, you and I are just talking to each other but I kind of know that I could tell you things and you'd be I'd feel comfortable with that when you, you know you can kind of get a feeling for who to talk to and of course it's an experiment so we try and if you know hope that we get a positive response and so forth but with with people in your audience you already have some relationships and friends and you kind of know who you can talk to already you know so there's a built-in safety valve that allows us to take a little risk and say a little more to a friend and then welcome them to, to you know to join us and do you ever feel this way you know that that kind of an exchange but it's terribly helpful to be able to bring what has been held down and secret and hidden to bring it up to let it let it come into the relationship let it come into the room keeping it held down and having to hide it is what gives it so much potency 